tonight will be in the 21st chapter of Genesis. I believe we'll complete this chapter tonight. There's a lot of things we want to see here. There are great principles and introductions to God that we want to focus on in this text. It's Genesis 21, verses 22 through 34. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phico, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now therefore swear unto me here by God, that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son. But according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me, and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of the well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abimelech said, I wot not who hath done this thing, neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it, but today. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by, thy, by themselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because there they swear, both of them. Thus they made a covenant of Beersheba, then Abimelech rose up, and Phi called the chief captain of his host, and they returned unto the land, into the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord God, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. Now at this point in the uh, Genesis record, approximately 2,000 years have passed since Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. That's as long as from Jesus' death until now, to kind of get a picture. And during this period of time, God is focused on certain people. 28 of them to be exact. 2,000 years, 28 people. I'll name them for you. Adam and Eve, we're going to include Satan. Cain, Abel, these are people that he made some extended comment about. Seth, Enoch, Noah, Ham, Canaan, Shem, Japheth, Nimrod, Terah, Nahor, Abraham, Sarah, Lot, Pharaoh of Egypt, King of Sodom, Chedorlaomer, Melchizedek, Eliezer, Lot's wife, Lot's daughters, Hagar, Ishmael, Abimelech. And I give what they are noted for. Some of them noted for blessing, some were noted for judgment, 28 people. I have not thought exhaustively about this, but I have an idea that they cover about every kind of human circumstance there is. These 28 people. Now I want to draw some preliminary conclusions from this. It's because in each of these cases, something about God was made known. These were just not people just like mentioned by themselves. Something about God was made known in his dealings with these people. See, God is known by his works. Amen. That's how he's known. So here in Genesis, we have him working with certain people, some for blessing, some for cursing. 
So in reviewing this, there's some certain conclusions we should come to. Yeah. Now I'll, I'll state them, but you, you probably have come to these conclusions, maybe not in these words, but something like this. You come to these conclusions. It should be obvious that history is being driven yeah. by an agenda. Yeah. That should like pop out to you right, right away. That agenda would be known as God's purpose or God's eternal purpose. It's expounded, it was introduced by Jesus and it was expounded by the apostles and the prophets gave little glimpses of it. But history is driven by an agenda. This can get away from you. In this day when there's a lot of communication and people learn about news right away, first you'll forget this. We've got to stir, our, stir up our minds on this, that history is driven by an agenda, by a divine established agenda. God is orchestrating history. Yes, amen. Amen. Now this being true, it's very important that we know what the agenda is. Yes. For a long time they didn't. For thousands of years the world didn't know what the agenda was. They just had some hints. Well, now with Jesus, now with Jesus putting away sin, being exalted to the right hand of God, sending forth the Holy Spirit to shed illumination on the subject, now this history is being made known. That really, this earth is not about earth. It's not about life here. That is not even what it's about. Amen. But what if the person that lives is though? That is what it's about. Yeah. You see, they haven't learned. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's something else that's a key factor. The fact is that key people were chosen to demonstrate this purpose mm -hmm. by God arbitrarily. These weren't people like who earned the right. Yeah. It wasn't that way at all. Key people that God used to indicate he's controlling the agenda. For example, Adam and Eve learned right away. <laughs> if God puts you out, you're out. Yeah, that's right. He didn't get, make any laws for them to make some appeals to get back into the garden. That was it. He did it. See? For Noah, when God decided to destroy everybody, that was it. Nothing could be done about it. No appeals made about it. So, but I'm showing here that God's agenda cannot be altered or delayed or put to the side or... It moves on, just steadily moves on, marches forward. Now in this agenda, God is working salvation in the midst of the earth. The psalmist saw that. That's what he's doing. He's working salvation in the midst of the earth. But for people who don't have eyes to see this, it looks like chaos. Yeah, yeah. And these people will complain a lot. And if you're not careful... You'll get caught up in this complaint syndrome. Yeah. And you'll begin to gripe about conditions. God raised up Israel to show you you don't want to do this. Amen. Even if you've got to walk through a hot desert where snakes and no water is, you can't do this. In our society, this is easy to do. We, we got to help help keep each other in check yeah. on this because if God's running the show, you can't complain because nothing occurs outside of His purpose. Mm -hmm. yeah. If it looks like it's contrary and adverse, there's something from Him that will come to you to it and do empower you to pass through the thing, or to handle it safely, or whatever's needed. Key people were chosen to indicate that this agenda is a controlling agenda. And the fact that hindering influences were removed, whether it was Adam and Eve in the garden, or whether it was all the people in the flood, or whether it was Sodom and Gomorrah, or whether it was dispersion at Shinar, this shows that the run who was running the agenda is superior to everybody else. Because he can just remove it. That's why when we pray, some prayer requests we give, we, there's nothing we really personally can do about the thing. Yeah. So we ask God because we know he's superior. He can like just push the hindrance. He can just remove it. That's, that's it. Or he can empower the person to go through it. As the sister Mary asked wisdom, he can... That's because he's controlling. Yeah. This couldn't be so if God wasn't controlling. Yeah. 
the whole agenda. And something more is involved than just providing the needs for humanity. It's got to be seen. Now the Word of God is written in such a manner as if a person has a preconceived idea of what God's doing, this dead wrong, this dead wrong, but and he puts that in, over the Bible. The Bible's written in such a way it'll look just like his idea is right. He'll be able to find statements that will appear to justify it. This completely erroneous idea. I'm sort of, sort of building a case why there has to be faith, see. Mm -hmm. With all of these, what, if you see these things correctly, you, you'd see the, the necessity of, yeah. of faith. God has so ordained the writing of Scripture so it appears to a person who doesn't believe it just like what they think is right. The Scripture refers to this as strong delusion. Yeah. Yeah. And it tells us that God sends it. Amen. Now, the devil delivers it, mm -hmm. but God sends it. Yes. Amen. You really got to say it? Yes. Sort of a lying spirit you sent to uh, That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's a, it's a tremendously liberating truth to see. Paul said, There was given me a thorn, but see, Satan delivered it. Because he's the minister of evil. Satan is the minister of evil. That's what he does, is evil. So sometimes there's things like this God needs to have done. He hands it over to Satan, but Satan has restrained. He, he can't step outside the boundary of God's purpose. Yeah. Or to put it another way, he can't tempt you above what you're able to bear. Yes? Yeah, another side of that. The, the of Satan, as God permits him, is also demonstrating the the character of Satan. Yes, and amen. Because so if it was hidden, men, it, it's helping us to hate evil and to identify evil. Amen. All right, now let's get to the uh, to our text here. <clears throat> Came to pass that at that time. That Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, <laughs> spake unto Abram, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now, when it comes to men at this point, the focus is Abraham. The focus isn't Abimelech, the focus isn't Phicol, the focus is Abraham. I want to just briefly cover this. That from Genesis. 11.29 on in Genesis the focus is Abraham and his seed that's what the entire from that point is what the entire Bible up from Genesis to Malachi it's what the entire Bible is about and you can even take it into the writings of the Apostle let me demonstrate this Terah that was Abraham's father and his household was mentioned but the attention quickly shifted to Abraham. <laughs> when the cities of Ur and Chaldea, or Ur and Haran were mentioned, it was because of Abraham. Sarah's mentioned because of Abraham. Land of Canaan was mentioned because God promised it to Abraham. Shechem and the plain of Moreh were mentioned because Abraham was there. Bethel was mentioned because of Abraham. When Egypt was mentioned, it's because Abraham was journeying there. The Egyptians and Pharaoh were mentioned just because they came in contact with Abraham. The princes of Pharaoh were mentioned because of their knowledge of Abram. When the house of Pharaoh was mentioned, it was because of his dealings with Abram. When Ai was mentioned, it was because Abraham camped near to it. We want you to see this for this <laughs> this focus because there's of course even a, a more dominant personality that comes into yeah. later in scriptural writings that everything centers in him. <clears throat> Damascus is mentioned because they it of its association with Abraham, Melchizedek, Eliezer, the river of Egypt, the river Euphrates, the nations occupying Canaan, Hagar, Ishmael, the way to Shur. Birle, Heroia, Kadesh, Barad, three heavenly messengers, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the experience of Lot and Gomorrah, Lot's wife and daughters, the record of Lot's wife turned into pillar of salt, 
The origin of the Moabites and Ammonites through Lot's daughters, Kadesh, Shur, and Gerar, Abimelech, king of Gerar, the wilderness of Beersheba, the message of an angel to Hagar, the wilderness of Paran and Beersheba. All of these are mentioned because, Abraham, because of Abraham. None of them would have been mentioned if it wasn't for Abraham. That's the one. <laughs> See, God's teaching people how to think. Amen. There are key people that everything's got to be sifted through. At this time, Abraham was the person. Everything sifted through him. You do some thinking about God via Abraham. That's how, that's how you did it. And I listed you 40 names there. 40. Names of people, nations, kings, cities, countries, plains, specific events. The only reason they're there is because God was working with Abraham. Now this is a divine manner. This is kind of the way God is. When he works with men, this is how he does it. His revelations have exclusively to do with him working out his purpose. In our text, he's working it out through Abraham. Matters that are not directly related to that just simply are just passed over. This being true, if this is true, modern day prophecies that had to do with weather and the jostling of nations and so forth are to the, at least to be questioned. Because this has never been the way God has done things. Giving news reports, <laughs> prognostications about weather. God has never been this way. Yeah. It's all, whatever he's talked about has always been immediately connected with his purpose and what he's doing. If there's not an obvious association with the purpose of God, as it's revealed in Christ, then they're nothing but fleshly observations. And if people may say, God showed me this, they just lied. It's, it's just that just that cut and dry. See, once you know what scripture is about and how God it's framed and how God talked, you can assess what people say. Yeah. Now, I admit that maybe there is a connection with God's purpose you don't see. I, I admit that that can, that can happen. But it will not be in the context where the world is, is eclipses heaven. It will not be in that kind of context. Now, in our day, <laughs> Christianity has become popular. And it's been largely in recent years has been to the, the music world. The Christianity has become popular, like it did in the days of Constantine, when Christianity became popular and became the religion of the Roman Empire, and it set Christianity in a decline which it has never recovered from. This is very important to see. What happens during a time like this when, when Christianity becomes popular is there's a shift in emphasis. Yeah, that's, right. that's what happens. The emphasis shifts from Christ, salvation, eternity, day of judgment, end of the world. It shifts to something else to make it more palatable to the masses. That's why. In order for this to happen, the exalted Christ in human perception has to take a back seat. Yeah. Now, they may not be willing to say this is what happened, yeah. but this is what happens. You can't underline something God did not underline and keep Jesus at the forefront. This cannot be done. This is impossible to do. Because Jesus is the implementer. Yeah of that purpose, which is primary, as I've shown you in the, in the introduction, as I showed you that God's purpose is driving everything. Jesus is, it, all that purpose has been turned over into Jesus' hands. So if at any point, mm -hmm. Jesus becomes dim or fades into the background or becomes secondary, this purpose is not seen. And if it's not seen, you can't live right. Amen. It's interesting, to say the least, it will be interesting, to say the least, to hear the divine assessment in the Day of Judgment of people who emphasize something other than Christ. This is, this is going to be very, we'll all be privy to it. 
We'll all hear it. In the meantime, while we wait the return of the bridegroom, it's imperative that our emphasis be right. Amen. That the main thing, the one thing, that it be right. Mm -hmm. It's imperative. If you have doubts about whether it is or not, then you've got to settle it in your mind to let everything else drop till you can see this. Yeah, and, especially when we talk about objectives. Because it's got to be something that only Jesus can do and that's can right. give. That's it's right. It's got to be that. <laughs> now Abimelech and Phicol, they come to Abraham and they say, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Oh, they've been observing Abraham. He didn't trace Abraham's success to his intelligence or to his possessions or to his skill or we can see God's with thee in all that thou doest. And he had a very limited knowledge of God. Now notice something. He did not say, you're God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Huh? <laughs> a lot of people say, you're God. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar said, the God of Daniel. God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's not, what, that's not what he said. He said, God. Mm -hmm. Oh, he learned something with that little episode with Sarah. Yeah. He learned something mm -hmm. about the real God. Remember, like made the same observation about Isaac, Abraham's son. Here's what he told Isaac. We saw certainly that God was with thee. Yeah, we, we saw it. We could tell it. God himself said to Jacob, Behold, I am with thee. Laban said to Jacob, I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Yeah. If you weren't here, I wouldn't be increasing like I am. It was said of Joseph, and the Lord is with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And his master saw that the Lord is with him. Again, it said of Joseph, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. God said to Joshua, look what God could do. These are things God can do now. God can do these things. Look what he said. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right or the left that thou mayest prosper in whatsoever thou doest. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. So all of a sudden, God turns a spotlight on Joshua and he's able to lead the people. They can see God is with them. <coughs> it said of Solomon, Solomon the son of David was strengthened in his kingdom and the Lord God was with him and magnified him exceedingly. One of God's promises to Israel was, Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt, the merchandise of Ethiopia, and the Sabians, the men of stature, shall come over unto thee, and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee. In chains shall they come over. They shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee. That's almost verbatim what Paul said that yeah. stranger said that came in the assembly. Remember the order? Uh -huh. Amen. Oh, <laughs> Zechariah prophesied of Israel, <clears throat> Ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the earth, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that's a Jew, saying, We will go with thee, for we have heard that God is with you. This is something that crops up in Scripture quite a bit. Mm -hmm. you, wouldn't you covet to have that said of you? Yes, amen. That people could observe. Hey, God's with him. In the case of Abraham, it was glaringly evident to Abimelech. Just in that in that part of the world, Abraham's life was a testimony. His life was a testimony that God was with him. And here's Abimelech; he saw it. <clears throat> now, there's some things this doesn't mean. Of course, this doesn't mean that the life of Abraham was trouble free. Two different men had to take his wife. He experienced famine.
happened to Jacob, he had to flee for his life, even though God is with him. And his wages were changed ten times, <laughs> even though God is with him now. Joseph was sent to prison uh, on the basis of a lie for about 13 years, even though God is with him. So the presence and blessing of God is confirmed in people's recovery from trials. How do they come out of them? Is the smoke on their clothes or not? Do they have lion's teeth marks on them or not? That's what testifies to God. Not whether you're able to stand up during the trial, that's good, but that's not, you got to wait, you got to wait to see how you come out of the trial. Abram went through a lot of trials. He didn't come out griping and complaining and cursing God and all this kind of, He didn't. He come out believing. Every time he come out believing. Yes, amen. That's what testified God is with him. Amen. It's my persuasion that our light of our light shines brightest when we're in trial. Yes. Amen. It's my opinion. But for some Christians, their worst times are when they're in trial. Yeah. Uh -huh. hmm? yeah. But probably this at some time could probably have been have been said about all of us that this was what we. I'm going to look at you and say, "Whoa, whoa, what are you going through? I can I can tell something's wrong." Yeah, but for other people, you can't tell when something's wrong if they don't tell you. You don't know. <laughs> That's when your light shines the brightest. Why? Because the contrast is clear. It is clear. See, it shouldn't be uh, easy to see. It ought to be noted that believers, professed believers, who are overcome by trial and faint when they're going through difficult circumstances, they're also noted by the ungodly. <laughs> They'll conclude, "Eh, they're just like we are." See? I say that to encourage your heart that there's grace for this. Amen. There's grace for this to walk about when you're in the furnace of fire yeah. or to sit calmly when you're in the lion's den or to go asleep when you're in prison like Peter. Yeah. See, there's... Or when your back's been beaten, you can sing praises at the midnight hour. See, there's grace to do this. Yes, and when you do, that's what testifies that God's with you. Now Abimelech, he sees God's for him, and he's thought this thing out pretty good. He doesn't want Abraham to be his foe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe he'd heard about how Abraham and his 318 servants mopped up four kings and all their armies. Maybe he, got, maybe he heard about that. So he says, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, Talk about planning for the future, huh? My son and my son's son, but according to kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me. And to the land. I treat the land well. Don't be uh, don't be destroying the land. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty sensitive about where we where we are in Christ Jesus. Don't anybody be fooling around with this yeah. residence. Amen. Trying to misrepresent or change yes, it. Right. Swear by God now that you'll do this. Now, this has caused some people a lot of trouble. Should we swear or take oaths or should we not? And some people have been a little bit too simplistic mm -hmm. in their approach to this. Let's look at this. Swearing or taking an oath. A lot of people have opposed it based on this, these words by Jesus, which we will address. Again, ye have heard it hath been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform to the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let thy communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than this is of evil. Cometh of evil. Now James, he 
he reinforces this. But above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. All right, now you notice in both the Lord's saints and James, they did not say by God. I'm sure you saw that. They did not say don't swear by God, which is what Abimelech said, asked to do. They said swore by something created or something made. God's not mentioned in that. Now there's some other factors to consider in this. God himself made an oath and swore. I swear by myself, he said to Jeremiah. He also said to have sworn to Abraham, Genesis 50, 24. And unto the fathers, I swear unto the fathers, Exodus 13, 5. When the Israelites did not believe the faithful report of Joshua and Caleb, the wrath of God was kindled, and he swore, as I live, saith the Lord, you're not going to get into Canaan. This is God. God made a promise to Abraham. He, when God made a promise to Abraham, Hebrews 6.13 said, He swear by himself. Peter declares that God swore with an oath to David. God made Jesus high priest with an oath. Hebrews 7. When the high priest solemnly commanded Jesus to by the living God tell whether he was the Christ, Jesus answered. Submitted to the request. He didn't say, I can't swear like that. He said, yes. Thou hast said. David swore unto the Lord and vowed under the mighty God of Jacob. Nehemiah took an oath from the priests. Nehemiah 5.12. The people of Nehemiah's day swore to walk in God's law. Nehemiah 10.29. The Lord of the Hebrews said, Men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation to them is an end of all strife. He doesn't say, but that's wrong. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. And Paul, he frequently would swear or take oaths. I'll give you some of them. God's my witness. Guess what that is? I say the truth in Christ. I call God for a record upon my soul. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knows that I lie not. We speak before God in Christ. I write unto you, Behold, before God I lie not. God is my record. God is my witness. I speak the truth in Christ. I charge thee before God. See, so this... <laughs> so, of course, you got to be careful when he says, Never take an oath. It's not quite that uh, simple. It's not wrong to call God to witness. Mm -hmm. It's not wrong to swear before God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Too many people have done it. Mm -hmm. And they weren't rebuked for doing it. Yeah. But it is wrong to swear by something that's made, something that's created by yourself or by your own integrity or by your parents. Mm -hmm. Some people I've heard, I swear my mother's grave. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing. See, these Jews were used to making flippant oaths to try and buttress what they promised so they just shoot off this, these oaths. That's what Jesus was condemning. Now, swear before God, you won't deal with me falsely. You won't, you won't break this agreement. You won't suddenly attack, you know, attack my family. Why did he say that? Well, in a sense, he was afraid of Abraham because he knew God was with him, see? Yeah, so he yeah. he didn't want to... That'd be like someone coming to you and say, Look, I know you're a Christian. Please don't pray, don't, don't pray against me. Because yeah. <laughs> I have prayed against some people. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you who they are. But <laughs> I have. I've prayed God to take them out. Mm -hmm. I tell you the truth. That's what David did. Sometimes he'd say, break their, break their teeth, yeah, break their arm. Uh -huh. <laughs> One time he pronounced, let their children, curse their children too. Uh -huh. 
Of course, you do that. <laughs> You have to do it. You can't do that hastily. That's not. You got to know what you're doing. You pray something like that. But you should live the kind of life that a thinking person would be afraid to deal falsely with you. Yeah. Now, there are people that would, no matter how holy you are, they wouldn't be afraid. I understand that. Abimelech asked that this be passed down to the generations. He's interested that. Now here was a king. Uh, he said, uh, speaking with a soldier, here's a king over a, some kind of territory who had an army. Fico was the captain's host. He's talking to one man that has 318 servants. I mean, he, Abimelech must have had a bigger army in Abraham had but he had made an association of God with Abraham and sometime go ahead I think Luke that records about the king he sees a, a, another king coming in with a larger army oh yeah and he sends him in terms of peace <laughs> that's he right me of this. this is what he's doing this wasn't yeah, a bigger right. army but there was no. more power yeah. bigger power hey, amen Now do this as a kindness that I did to you. The kindness he did to him was when he gave him oxen and men servants and women servants and that's when he was kind to Abraham after he had been corrected. He told Abraham, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleases thee. Just wherever you want, wherever you want to live. Now I, that was kind. So be kind to me like that. It's in fact, this is what God has said to you when you come into Christ Jesus. He sets you in heavenly places. He says, now, live wherever you want to live. Yeah. <laughs> Have as much as you want. Just, just reside here. And Abraham said, I will swear. And then he said something. He reproves. After he swore, I'm going to do you kind. He reproves Abimelech because of a well of water, which his servants had violently taken away. You know, John referred to God as the true God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Abimelech had, a, had an altercation yeah. with God. That's right. Had <laughs> yeah. any of the gods that Abimelech had been serving to that point spoken to him? Yeah, Just the fact that God spoke to Abimelech. That's right. Mm -hmm. Distinguished him from any other god, but he went beyond that and shut the wounds. Yeah, they shut the wounds. So he made an association with the god who was over God. So Amen. when it uh, God of gods, when Nebuchadnezzar said that that he was the god of gods, yes, wasn't it yes. So he recognized that there was like a supreme as men call it, a supreme being, someone yeah. who's over all gods. Mm -hmm. And the association with Abraham is what caused him to be so careful. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he didn't say now, we're all worshiping the same God. Yeah. Uh, he did. He knew this, this was a unique God he was talking about. Now Abraham reproves, corrects him, about something that evidently existed for a little while. Now he's speaking as one to whom God has promised this land. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's how he's speaking. He knows God's given him this land. Uh -huh. It ought to be noted that Abraham was not a chronic complainer. He hadn't been bringing this up. Said, hey, you remember that well? He didn't bring this up till after there was an amiable association of him and Bimelech. It was a well that had been violently taken away, which means they had stopped Abraham's servants from using it, and they'd taken over the well yeah. and was using it for themselves. Actually, this is, this is what's happened in Christendom. Yeah. Strangers have taken over the well. Yeah, amen. That's right. And they've contaminated yeah, it. That's right, amen. <laughs> violently taken away. Now this is important because this is a dry area and wells were important to sustain sustenance of life. Abraham had a large household, he had a lot of flocks. This is important to have. And he, uh, from a practical point of view, he will tell, he probably had dug the well himself and here the 
servants of Abimelech had taken it away. But see, this was a trying Abraham's faith. I don't know how long this circumstance had existed, but however long it had existed constituted a trial of Abraham's faith. It didn't say he went someplace else. <coughs> Important to see this. Nebimelech, he says, hey, I don't know anything about this. I never heard about this. Until this day, I didn't know about it. You didn't tell me either, by the way, which told you you wasn't a complainer. Yeah. But this tells you something about Abimelech. This was his territory. This was in his kingdom, and he didn't know what was going on in his kingdom. Now, if we're talking about men, all right, we understand it. But listen, God's not like that. Yeah, that's right. God knows what's going on in his kingdom. Yes, amen. Everything is going on in his kingdom. And it seems to me that Abimelech sensed this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now both of them make a covenant, an agreement. In other words, Abraham was a peacemaker. He, this, look at this as making peace. Where there was a, didn't have to have trouble. Some, some people you can't make peace with. You can't make peace with, with uh, blaspheming Philistines. You can't, yeah, right. you can't make peace with them. You, you can't make peace with the Midianites. You, <laughs> you could make peace here because there was a... Well, God was quieting things down so Abraham could walk through the land. Yeah. Remember, I haven't forgot, this is what Abraham's doing. He's, surveying the land that God's given him. So God is quieting things down. And this is the way he did it, by making peace. This is still God's manner. He says to us, if it be possible, as much as lie then you, live peaceably with all men. See, it's the same. Don't, don't, don't stir up trouble if it doesn't need to be. Follow peace with all men. Scriptures tell us, Jesus, blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called the children of God. Now, peace must never be at the expense of holiness. You can't forfeit something God gave you to make peace. You can't do that. But there's some. There's a certain kind of peace that can be made without forfeiting what God has given you. And of course, as I think of this, Christ is the ultimate peacemaker. He made peace. Abraham didn't make peace. He agreed to keep it. <laughs> but Jesus made peace. Now both of them made the covenant. That means it was a bilateral or two-sided covenant. Now Abraham, he does something here that Abimelech doesn't know what he's done. Abraham set seven new lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? He said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Ewe lambs are young lambs. Some say young female lambs, but they're young lambs that you can see grow up. And the patriarch seeks to establish peace in an honorable way. Gives them these seven new lambs, sets them aside from the other general ones that he gives, sets them aside. So now this is a witness unto me. And it should be a witness unto you. These every time these lambs are seen, remember, I dug this well. Yeah. If I see them frolicking and run, I remember I mm -hmm. this this is my well. Mm -hmm. I dug this well. Now that's a type of things to come. We've also, God has set aside a lamb as a witness. Yeah. Read it here. Amen. And when it's there, it's a witness. Mm -hmm. I dug this well. Yeah, amen. Amen. I dug this well of salvation. That's right. I dug it. Yeah. You draw water out of the wells of salvation, but you didn't dig them. I dug them. Yeah. See, it's a, it's a type. Yeah. It's a type of that. <laughs> He called the place Beersheba. This is the second time that word is mentioned in the Bible, Beersheba. First time it was mentioned was the wilderness of Beersheba. This is the first time it's a place, a sanctified 
place established. Now, Beersheba was a key place in the Promised Land. It's mentioned 30, 34 times in Scripture. So it's a prominent place. The city of Beersheba was on the border, southmost border of the Promised Land. Dan was the northmost part of the Promised Land. So to Abraham, just it's it just inside the borders of the Promised Land. The Scripture quite often says, "From Dan to Beersheba." Dan, that's the whole territory. Remember when God one time sent a curse because David numbered Israel and 70,000 men died from Dan to Beersheba. What it says. So it's a, it's, a, it's a marking point. See, the promised land had boundaries. Just like our the heavenly places we walk in, they have boundaries. You want to live in, and Jerusalem was kind of in the middle. Jerusalem wasn't the northmost, wasn't the southmost, it was kind of in the center. And that's how it is with heavenly places. You want to dwell kind of in the, in the center of them. You don't want to try and get close to the border. Quite parallel to the kingdom of God. And here's something else to be seen. That this covenant was made in the promised land, not in the land of the Philistines. <laughs> because it says in the next verse, they return to the land of the Philistines. So this... The covenant was made in the promised land. That's where the agreement was made. That any major decisions you make, you want to make in the promised land. You want to make in the heavenly places, in fellowship with Christ. And when you're at peace with God, when you're walking in the Spirit, when you're living by faith, you all those that's when you make your decisions. Now with things like this, David, this is like a landmark, Beersheba, it's like a landmark. David said, if the foundations be destroyed, what can? What can the righteous do? Solomon said, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Don't tamper with these landmarks. Again, he said, Proverbs 23, 10, remove not the old landmark. Now, as a principle that's seen here, Abram established a permanent landmark. There are landmarks, foundations, that are not to be tampered with. If they are moved, the righteous are instantly put at a handicap. Now, I'm going to name some of the landmarks that, in my judgment, have been removed. The righteousness of God. Yeah, that's right. The nature and necessity of divine choice. Mm -hmm. The grace of God. Mm -hmm. The sovereignty of God. The necessity of Christ's death. See, very few people talk about the necessity yeah, of it. Yeah. The power of Christ's resurrection. The exaltation of Christ. The truth of Christ's second coming. The necessity of the new birth. The imputation of righteousness. The criticality of faith. The role of hope. The malignancy of sin. The nature and newness of life. It's just a few. These are landmarks that are not known by modern Christians. Their knowledge of these things are almost at a zero level. Then why would anyone expect to appear in a holy church in a circumstance like this? Why would anyone expect Christians to be stable and solid in a circumstance like this? The foundations have been moved. They've been shifted. Which means thinking has become distorted and people don't have a grasp on life. So the covenant was made in the promised land. Now it says of Abimelech, after they made this covenant, Phicol is chief captain, they returned into the land of the Philistines. <laughs> I mean, they, they had a respect for Abraham and they knew God was with them, but I mean, they didn't really prefer this area around Bethel. They went back to the land of the Philistines. Now, here's something important to note. This land had been promised to Abraham, but it, it wasn't his yet. Yeah. There was such a, there was such a thing as the land of the Philistines. Mm -hmm. See, that would be destroyed when Israel was given the land. But 
Remember God told the people, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, when he brings you into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and it cast out the many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thyself. When the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, and thou shalt make, thou shalt make no covenant with them. Well, Abraham made a covenant, but they hadn't been given the land yet. Yeah. They been promised it, but they didn't have it. Uh -huh. Yet, said, don't make a covenant with them, don't show mercy to them, make no marriages with them, so forth. But during the time of Abraham, the, the cup of the Amorites' iniquity was not yet full. Yeah, right. So until... They come in to take the land. The land did, in reality, belong to these heathen nations. They, but God was going to dispossess them. Yeah. He's going to take it away from them. Now Abraham, he's in the process of gaining familiarity with the land. So that's why he makes the covenants. He can move about without being uh, threatened. And he's, he's, this is a pre-spying out of the land. <laughs> And the land is actually spied out three times. Abraham spied it out. Mm -hmm. Then when they first come to the land, they sent out the 12 spies. Then when they entered in, they sent out some spies again. So it was spied out three times. Yeah. This is the pre-spy. pre, pre -spy. Yeah, right. Here. And he, uh, he sojourned in the land by faith, gaining familiarity this is exactly what we're doing. See, this is exactly what we're doing. In Christ Jesus, we're surveying what God has given us, and he's given us, he gives us samples to survey. We're becoming familiar, learning how to handle the things of God, what God has promised. We're learning how to expect the promise of God, what kind of things God has promised. Becoming, that's why we meet together. That's why we do what we do. We're, we're gaining familiarity with what we're eventually going to inherit in its totality. Amen. 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 And we're doing it, a, we do it a, as much as possible in a peaceful environment. Yeah. Just like Abraham did. Now, whether you're talking about Abimelech or Phicol or Abraham, all of them want to live where they prefer. Now for Abimelech and Phicol, they preferred the land of the Philistines, so they went back there. For Abraham, he stayed, he preferred. See, everybody really does what they prefer. Let right. yeah. me be more precise. Everyone occupies the place they prefer. Sometimes you do have to do things you don't prefer. <laughs> but you occupy the land, you do it unto the Lord. Now it says Abraham planted a grove. Now other versions read, he planted a tamarisk tree. Basic Bible English says he planted a holy tree. Septuagint says he planted a field. Several versions say he planted a tamarisk. The Jewish Bible says he plowed fields. Wycliffe, uh, the English Revised Version says he planted a special tree. Wycliffe says a wood. We would say woods. Mm -hmm. Or did Abraham plant a tree or a grove or plow a field? or what, what, what did he do? I sometimes marvel all these verses. What, even what, 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 who, had, who had a grasp of what really was going on? Mm -hmm. Now I'll tell you the way I personally evaluate versions. This is just my own. I prefer a version that was written before the Age of Reason. Amen. Because of the Age of Reason, the Enlightenment, which is in the 1800s, the thinking of the Christian world changed because it was, it was a movement. The Enlightenment was where they kicked God out. And that, it was actually a reaction to Catholicism, but the, they kicked God out and the exalted human reason and man was 
they told people, you can think the thing out. You don't need someone to tell you what to think. You can think the thing out. And there was a sense in which this was right if you're talking about Catholicism and popes and bishops and stuff like that. But it's the introduced a virus into human thinking. And the first English revision came after the Enlightenment. It was the English Revised Version. And there have been so many since then, they're innumerable, and now they're revising the revisions and updating the revisions. And men have just, they've assigned too much value to human reasoning. So my own, the way I personally think, I want a version that was written before this virus was entered and affected the thinking of people. And most of the earlier versions do say Grove. And most of the lexicographers tell you that that is a valid translation of the word. No etymologist says, no, it can't mean grove. Nobody says that. They all say, or they mention grove. So I, I choose to think he planted a grove. If it was a tamarisk tree, it was a bunch of them. He planted a grove. Someplace that would mark this place. And there, at this place where he expended some labor, right? He expended some labor, he invested something of himself yeah. in this place. And there he called on the name of the Lord. Here's the first time this is mentioned, the everlasting God. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the NIV reads the eternal God. Prior to this, there was only one reference to God, to everlasting, and that was Noah's, Noah had an everlasting covenant. Then Abraham, he had an everlasting covenant. But like even the word wasn't mentioned, aside from those two instances, the word everlasting or eternal wasn't even mentioned. Now it's associated with God, which means Abraham has been learning to these 25, 26 years, however many there were, probably around close to 30, he's been learning about God. Everlasting. He called on the name of the everlast, the Lord, the everlasting God. Now there's nothing in all of nature that provides you an accurate portrayal of eternal. And so human wisdom doesn't have it because human wisdom can't extend beyond human experience. See, human experience is the border of human knowledge. So how did he know about an eternal God? He knew it by his experience with God. And God hadn't, to my knowledge, commented a lot about this. This was like a, a deduction, a holy deduction. God's an eternal God. So it is a marvel at the beginning, that early, that Abraham made this association. Now we ought to make a word, say a word about the bane or the curse of an earth-centered religion that pushes men further from God and obscures more the eternality of God. Brother Jeremy. Anyway, uh, people that put a lot of focus on science and stuff like that. That's right. Christian science and stuff is comes up short at best because That's right. it, it takes faith to be able to see God. Amen. <coughs> and Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. Sojourning. Let's take, take, take a look at sojourning. Some versions say he stayed in the land. I, I don't like that version. He resided as an alien. That's good. He went on living in the land. That's, that's no good. He lived as a foreigner. All right, he was a stranger. He, living Bible says he just lived in the land. Well, that, no, the point isn't just that he lived in the land. The point is he lived in the land as a sojourner. Yeah, that's right. yeah. A sojourner is someone that's not permanent. Yeah. He's journeying through. In Abraham's case, he was walking throughout the land, see? He was not just living there for a lengthy period of time. Yeah. And of course the scriptures make a point of this that by faith Abraham when he was called to go out to a place that he would afterward receive for an inheritance 
obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles or tents and this went up into Isaac and Jacob. So they, that's what a sojourner is. It, Israel, when they went through the wilderness for 40 years, they were sojourning in the wilderness. When they got to Canaan, they quit sojourning. Yeah. <laughs> they were sojourning when they moved into Canaan. Mm -hmm. They built houses, That's right, yeah. not tents. Yeah. Yeah. See, now in Christ, we're building tents. Mm -hmm. We're temporary residents here. We only try and have what we need. Mm -hmm to make it through without distraction. We're sojourners, strangers and pilgrims Amen. is what Peter called it, sojourning. I mean, Abimelech and Phicol went back to the land of the Philistines, but Abraham, he sojourned in the land of promise. Again. Yes. First thing I thought of when you said, on this earth we only build tents, not houses. and and. We, we have a mansion in heaven. Mm -hmm. God, God has promised us, and it's not just a house. It's a, a, a mansion. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, Satan has various ways to try and tempt us to live as though we were permanent residents of the earth. Uh -huh. I mean, in our head, in our theology, we may admit that this is not the case, but... You can live like this is the case. If you're not careful, Satan will lure you to, into a path where you'll live like, like this is where you belong. Yeah. Yeah. But this isn't where you belong. Amen. After all, we shall inherit the earth. We haven't inherited it yet. Yes. Amen. We haven't inherited it yet. Yeah. But we will. Mm -hmm. Meantime, we're spying out the land. Now make it clear in your reason that in Christ we don't receive anything that you have to give up. That's right. Ultimately give up. Mm -hmm. Jesus will not give you anything mm -hmm. that you ultimately have to give up. Yep. Amen. You say, what about the things that we give to heaven in this life? They're loaned. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. They're on loan. Yep. you got to give them back. Yep. That's right. Yeah, the, the talents that he gave you, you got to give them back. Yes, see, see, you're a steward of everything else, but what he gives you mm -hmm. in, in salvation, what he gives you is what you will keep, yes, amen. not what you will give up. You really give the things mm -hmm. that you've struggled to be able to, the insights you've, you've been able to, to observe and yeah. understand, you'll carry those over carry to the over. other. That's right. Yeah. Anything that's immediately connected with this yes. purpose, you keep. Amen. Until the day of the Lord, we're like we're sojourners in the land. Now, in conclusion, we're being introduced to the Father of all them that believe. Yes. That's who we're reading about. We're not just reading about a man. This is the Father of all them that believe. And with the exceptions of some cursory details of his father and brothers and wife, God omits any detail in the first 74 years of Abraham's life. Why? He's structuring the record. So you will see his father of the faith. He's not going to go into a lot of details that have no bearing on that. Now I list here. I forget how many things I listed here. Things that were made known to Abraham, things he was involved with. Twenty. Twenty snapshots of Abraham's life. There they are. Yep. Twenty snapshots of Abraham's life. They span 25 years of time. 75 to what to the birth of Isaac 100. In them we witness these following things. See, that you don't know a lot, but you know what pertains to God's purpose. His response to the Word of God. That's, that's spelled out. His response to the promises of God. His response to the blessing of God. His response to adverse conditions. His response to challenge, like Lot being captured. His response to conflict, 
Lot and his servants of Lot and his servants. His response to the word of divine destruction. God told him I'm going to destroy Sodom. His response to the requirement to do something difficult and grievous. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. His approach to peaceful agreements. Abimelech and... See, the record has been tailored yeah. deliberately by God so you should not come out thinking about Abraham's faults. Yeah. Amen. 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 Right. Well, let's say a person does come out thinking about Abraham's faults. Then they have missed mm -hmm. all together yes. missed what God was saying. God has structured yeah. this record yeah. Abraham was a man. We don't have to have a record of him having faults. He was a man. We know that already. He sinned and fell short of the glory of God. But God did not write up Abraham to prove that point. He wrote up Adam and Eve. And he wrote up Cain. And he wrote up the world of Noah's day to prove that point. He did not give Abraham's record to prove that point. And if a person uses Abraham as an example of someone that failed they're going to have to account for it. Because yeah. that's not why God told us about Abraham. Uh, the exposition of the apostles and prophets in the spirit affirmed that. That's right. Because they never mentioned mm -hmm. anything like that. They only mentioned these, this as, well, they emphasize his faith and the other aspects that's of right. the implications of his faith. Mm -hmm. Now, we shouldn't balk at this. There's been other people like this, like Aaron. Mm -hmm. The record of Aaron is structured, so you think about him as high priest. Yeah, uh-huh. With Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. You just know enough about Melchizedek to know what his position. This is how God writes up history. This is how he does it. Mm -hmm. This is how he's going to do it on the day of judgment, too. <laughs> when you stand before the Lord, mm -hmm. he's, going to, he's going to exonerate you. Brother Isaac. And really, we should not think of any of the, uh, uh, of the patriarchs of old as someone who God's put in place for us to find something wrong with them. Even because, I mean, we've all heard of, heard of Abraham and his supposed faults, or any of the other well, yes. uh, apostles or uh, patriarchs. But again, that's, I, I know you've said that um, we can't judge someone who doesn't have the same or the same revelation that we have had. Yeah. And we're in no, um, we, we have no, we, we don't have any uh, like authority or anything of, the, of that nature just to say, for us to point the finger on someone who had less revelation than we have. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it's someone whom God has made extended common. Do you mm -hmm. think all God said about Abraham? I mean, <laughs> it's, more, it's probably a lot more than any other person. And he said so much about Abraham without going into those kind of details. Why? Mm -hmm. Because that is not how he wants us to think about Abraham. Yes, he wants us to think about Abraham as the father of the faithful, not the father of the unfaithful, or the father of the, father of the transgressors, or the father of those who make mistakes. That's not how he wants us to think of him. And when you think of him as the father of the faithful, you'll read these texts about him differently. You'll, you'll see, you'll come away marveling that he survived. Mm -hmm. You'll come away kind of staggered in yourself that he, that he was so little, he was so faithful, and he shaped his whole life mm -hmm. around what God told him. Amen. His entire life was shaped around what God Amen. told him. Oh, it's, a, it's a marvelously edifying. Amen. I think I'll close there. Yes, Brother Ricky? Yes. It's marvelous to see how faith is able to reason and come to good godly conclusions. That's right. Especially as it concerns their knowledge of God. When he when he was able to see this about God being an everlasting God, I just want to see here that this is perfectly reasonable for him to come to this Amen. conclusion. Amen. If Job is kind of a contemporary of Abraham, Job was able to to look and reason upon a tree cut down, a sprout coming up out of the tree, and be able to reason that there must be a resurrection. Amen. He talked about the, his Redeemer standing at the latter days, yeah. and him after the worms had consumed his body so worm with such mm -hmm. little. But see, there's, yeah. there's a testimony to his faith. Now, Abraham has already had the demonstration of God 
bringing life from death, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Not the resurrection of a dead, but to see a dead womb give life. That's right. Mm -hmm. but Sarah like gave man. life. And <laughs> him being past giving life, yeah. uh -huh. to actually give life. So he thought about this and reasoned well, on amen. this. Mm -hmm. Of course, this will later encourage him also when he has to offer up his son, mm -hmm. that he, well, he just got, he concluded he'd raise him from the dead. Mm -hmm. So we'll go offer an offering and we'll come back. So mm -hmm. it's marvelous to see that faith can do this with so little because particularly in this age you have so much given by God mm -hmm. of how many marvelous implications you can see in the scriptures by faith and come to proper conclusions about God. Yes, amen. 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 Now, he, there's another thing to see here too that this is uh, can be traced to the divine imagery in man. Mm -hmm. Yes. Too, that man given faith man is made to be able to yes, amen. Amen. to do this yes. yeah amen. yes brother Levine I thought the, uh, the commentary on the landmarks is, mm. is is really good and really thought-provoking because you know we 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 live in a time where the landmark has been moved so many times yeah. where yeah. the landmark is so far off, but people think that's the norm. Yeah. So anytime yeah. someone gets back to where the landmark's supposed to be, you're considered a radical. Yeah, that's yeah. right. You're, you're right. Not a radical. You're, 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 you're right. You, you become. You're really the norm, but you're looked at as a radical because yeah. it's gotten so far off. And you're that's right. What uh, what the church has, uh -huh. you know, Amen. done to this day, where it, you know. It's, it was like that, it, what was it, Josiah's time when, yes, when right. they finally yeah. found the scrolls and put yeah. it out. Yeah. When they started reading it, the people wept. Oh, yes. Yeah. They we're living so wrong. <laughs> we're in a dangerous spot. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, he, he, he said, we got to find out for someone who knows God. we got to find out what we, we're supposed to do. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> a good portion, this is not true of everyone, but a good portion of humanity lives their lives as if their life is the only thing that matters, the only thing that counts, that it, it is the point of reference for all things. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so when the, when, the, when they see something outside of their own lives, it's frightening, it's threatening, it's, yeah. it's, it's alien, it's, it can't be right because it's not me. Mm -hmm. Probably none of you have, have ever heard anybody say, what does that have to do with us now? <laughs> huh? Yeah. We thank the Lord for the yes. record of Abraham. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for Abraham. We can see Your hand working with him. And we, Lord, see that this is, this is the way You work with those who believe in You. This, this is how You work with them. And so we, we ask for grace to be steadfast in our faith, fight the good fight of faith, and stay on the course. And we believe, Father, that as you have promised, it will go well with the righteous. In Jesus' name, amen.